there is no position in fantasy football more difficult, more difficult to just project, to figure out every year than the tight end position. Year after year, mediocre players, they get hyped up out of desperation. If you miss out on those studs, you can be left languishing with single-digit performances every week. So the tight end position, it's really difficult every year. But this year, we've got a really promising set of rookies who are sneaking up draft boards. I've brought on a guy who's talked about t- rookie tight ends a lot lately, Hayden Wings of Underdog Fantasy. We're going to decide if these tight ends are overvalued or undervalued. Hayden, we'll get into our first player soon. But first, mm-hmm. do you think with these rookies as a whole, do you think this is the best class we've seen in years? I do think so. I think that Kyle Pitts was better than all of them individually, but this they go five deep, and I think all five of them have had some pot- potential. Obviously, we got Washington more as a blocking type now, so there's now it's down to four, but the landing spots was the key part of this. And if you look at some of like the historical data on tight ends, it's really nasty. But if you also look at who the quarterbacks were and the teams they went to, it was even nastier than that. So this year... Obviously, Kincaid's more of a slot type attached to one of the best offenses in the league. That's a good landing spot. Luke Musgrave and Laporta are basically competing with nobody. In Luke Musgrave's case, it's against another rookie tight end. So that narrative that rookies don't see the field at tight end could be thrown out because he's one of the rookie tight ends is going to be playing in Green Bay. It's definitely going to be Luke Musgrave. And then even Michael Mayer, like all things considered, Austin Hooper at this stage of his career is not that much of a bar to clear and Michael Mayer I thought had a lot of potential as a receiver just because Notre Dame would motion or out he would be used kind of like actually like Mark Andrews where they would like get him out in the slot like actually make him run legit routes against corners so yeah it's a very fun class but I think more importantly the landing spots seem to be pretty solid for all of them yeah and we're going to touch on a few more of them later but you mentioned the first player it is mark andrews current adp he's the tight end to adp on underdog 28.1 on sleeper redraft half ppr formats he's going at 25.4 and we've got wrote this is on un- uh, underdog adp tracker up here and you can see that he's kind of climbed from being in the low to mid 30s up to the back end of the like almost fringing onto the second round so it's not been a huge move but when you're talking about moving like six spots at that area of the draft it is quite noticeable in terms of him as a player i mean like he led all tight ends with a 28 percent target share last year and in the games which he's played with lamar jackson over the last three years 7.3 targets per game 59.6 yards per game he's pretty much i mean it's only travis kelsey ahead of him and people will talk about okay, well, Lamar Jackson's been unable to stay healthy for the last couple of years, but we've also seen Andrews do it without. So I think it seems completely fair that Mark Andrews is tight end too, but do you think he deserves to be going quite this high up at the boards, or do you think it's just that sort of people miss out on Travis Kelsey and feel the need to grab an elite tight end? I think with these tight ends, it's about the upside appeal. And I do think that it's him and Kelsey when it comes to these like ungodly potential seasons. Maybe you can sell me on Darren Waller at this point. But with Mark Andrews, what's hard this season is he's never dealt with this much target competition. And I know it's like kind of like people kind of brush that aside, but I do think like target competition does matter in fantasy football. Um, and they go three deep, but at the same time, Mark Andrews has been absolutely ludicrous, a second round value approaching first round value when he's been healthy. And when Lamar Jackson has been healthy, I have him ranked inside the third round, kind of like in the beginning half of the third, third round, I would love to pair him up with Lamar Jackson when they can, but in redraft, I even like him more because in best ball, you can ping pong the weeks of the late round tight ends. In redraft, you got to decide when those touchdowns are coming or where the targets are coming from. And I feel pretty good that Mark Andrews, even if he can't repeat the 2021 numbers, I do think that there could be a, even then a tier gap between Mark Andrews and the rest of them. Yeah, I think what you said was a good point because, like, you know, you look back at Lamar Jackson's MVP season in 2019 and he was throwing to Mark Andrews. But then after that, Hollywood Brown, Willie Sneed, Seth Roberts, Miles Boykin. It was a real, you know, it was pretty miserable. And now Lamar's definitely going to have the best offense that he's ever had. Jeff Zerobek of The Athletic reported that he still thinks that Mark Andrews is going to absolutely dominate in that. Yep. So I, I feel pretty good. There's, 
it definitely would be nicer if it was an easier stack to make. It feels a bit like you've kind of got to reach around the two free turn in best ball at the minute. But we'll get to our second player in a moment. But if this is the first time that you've come into the Fantasy Sanctuary, we appreciate you being here. We've got one simple goal to help you win your fantasy football leagues. We aim to do that with these nice visuals you see on screen, help you remember all the key data. Hit that subscribe button. You're not going to regret it. Let's get to the next one. It is Darren Waller, who you mentioned before. I mean, he's had this kind of banana type ADP where he started up around the 70s, then dropped all the way down as the Giants kept adding more and more pass catches and things kind of like there wasn't any hype through that period. And then as soon as training camp hits and he's just mossing defenders constantly, you know, he's the only really tall <laughs> attacking option for the Giants. So it's kind of jumped up. And it feels kind of warranted to an extent, but now like he's going at pick 60 on underdog, pick 65 on sleeper. He's averaged 7.5 targets per game over the last four years. I know Josh Norris, your co-host on underdog fantasy, he's really high on him. Are you as high as Josh is? No, I'm not. Um, but I've been wrong this entire offseason on him. It's to me, I was looking at I didn't think that he was moving as well last year. He didn't force a single missed tackle. He's missed some time. He's a little bit on the older side, and things have kind of always been up in the air with Darren Waller. Now, ever since that, he has been healthy this entire training camp. The reports have been fantastic. I trust Brian Dayball completely. Obviously, the wide receiver group is a work in progress over there. So, like to me, this is the most boom bust uh, tight end in all of fantasy. If you want to play that game in best ball, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, on some of the other default rankings, like on like ESPN and Yahoo, he goes even a little bit later than this. So I am fine with him in those formats. I have not been drafting him at all on underdog so far. That scares me, um, but really just comes down to, I believe he's going to be a beast whenever he's out there. Will it last? That's an unknowable thing, but I do think that he has some of the higher odds of like picking up some kind of nagging injury just based off of his age and injury history. Yeah, it seemed like it just didn't seem like a good season for him on and off the field last year with the Raiders. I mean, Derek Carr was kind of say, suggesting that he thought that Waller wasn't playing for injuries he should play yeah. through, where uh, Josh McDaniels, the two of them, didn't seem to particularly get on. So it feels like the right time for a fresh start for him. But do you feel like he's kind of landed in a spot where he's correctly valued now because he's kind of hopping ahead of Kill, he's hopping ahead of Pitts? Uh, are you okay with that? I am. Uh, Kittle's also just as old as Waller, and he's dealing with the same injury as he had last year, that groin injury, and Kittle's had a little bit of a injury history. And then beyond that, now like Brandon Ayuk's in the prime of his career, so now it's like I don't feel comfortable extrapolating the George Kittle peak seasons and those elite ceiling games. Now, when you have Christian McCaffrey and peak Brandon Ayuk, I just don't think that's necessarily going to hold up. Um, so yeah, I think I'm more comfortable in rolling the dice on Darren Waller. And then for Kyle Pitts, there's still, I guess some knee injury risk, but really it's just like kind of the offense and how much he'll be utilized. And if, even if he is being utilized, can Ritter throw an accurate pass to him? So I have Darren Waller as my tight end for, um, in redraft leagues, I'm still undecided on how I should be playing this. I think I like going Mark Andrews or waiting all the way to like David and Joku and then like grabbing a Luke Musgrave and just seeing what happens with that kind of tier. But I would not blame anybody for buying into the hype on Darren Waller. Brian Dayball is going to make him an X receiver and he will get fed a bunch of targets early on. Yeah, I think that's a really key point, particularly if you're looking at redraft. Like his consistency is probably going to be much easier to rely on in redraft leagues than. Mm -hmm. George Kill or Cal Pitts, who we'll get to now. I mean, his ADPs just slowly just dropped and dropped as news kind of drip fed out that he wasn't fully recovered from the injury that sidelined him for the last few games of last year. And then it's just not been particularly pretty. You know, on Sleeper, he's going at pick 60, which is ahead of Darren Waller by a couple of spots. On Underdog, he's dropped down to 76. And it just always feels like we're still chasing the dream undeniable ceiling outcomes that Kyle Pitts has had. But he's had three career touchdowns in two seasons, one top five weekly performance. We definitely haven't seen the best of it. Do you think that like Desmond Ritter can do that? Because we know they're going to pass more than they did under Marcus Mariota because he was so dreadful after Smith just shut things down. But do you think Desmond Ritter can do enough to unlock Kyle Pitts? I don't think Desmond Ritter is very good. So I have some problems with this offense, certainly. Now, the bar of being better than Marcus Mariota is about as low as it gets as well. So 
I think Kyle Pitts will have a much better season this year than he did last year. The fact that he was out there in these preseason games is bullish to me, though he wasn't playing the full-time snaps. But I, if I had to guess, I guess most likely scenario is they're just slow playing him. There's like no need to play him all these snaps in preseason. So I have not drafted him basically at all this entire summer. I think I have like 2% like through like almost 100 drafts. I will be drafting him now that his ADP has fallen this far. I think the opportunity costs a lot of the running backs and wide receivers that I feel pretty good about having some upside are kind of off the board once we get to like the 80s. And I think that Kyle Pitts still has some of the, the ceiling outcomes. And especially now that we know like the the late round tight ends that I was that I was targeting like round 18. Now they're like round 13 picks. Like it's not like I'm like passing up on all this value. Now I think like everyone's kind of getting more appropriately priced. So this is the time for me to be drafting some more Kyle Pitts. But I would guess most likely outcome, very boom bust, ends up as like the tight end six or seven on the year, has a couple moments where you're like, this dude could be the tight end one in Dynasty moving forward. But I do think Desmond Ritter will hold back this offense. Yeah, and just going back, I think what's kind of different about Kyle Pitts to a lot of the other tight ends, particularly the ones further down this list we're going to get into, is Pitts has gets used downfield so much more and like he led the position in air yards per game with 81.6 despite only seeing 5.9 targets per game so which was rare like the eighth most so it's like yeah it really is rare but then, i mean mario was just awful like pitts was second in target share amongst tight ends but was 47th in catchable mm-hmm. ball rate among tight ends with 25 targets or more which was dead last so it's like it just I feel for some of the people in the dynasty community who really hyped him up as this guy who should have been taken as the 101 even in super flex time premium drafts but we haven't seen desmond ritter with cow pitt so i feel like there's a few glimmers of hope for him and yeah i feel like i'd definitely be more comfortable taking him in best ball than i would in redraft particularly mm-hmm. given that on sleeper he's going 12 picks earlier yep. uh, do let us know in the comments so if you're in and out or c- on kyle pitts because i feel like he's going to be a very divisive pick this year and some people feel quite strongly about that moving on we'll get outside the top 100 it's dalton schultz who again is another tight end who's seen his adp drop quite a bit before it's picking slightly back up now but again that's wrote of his adp tracker which you can see on their site and he's at 135 an underdog going 23 22 picks higher on sleeper at 113. last year he was the tight end 11 in points per game it's seven top 12 weekly finishes but it still felt like a bit of a backward step from the previous year when he'd come from nowhere and he was that late round tight end that you really wanted who'd cost you nothing. Whereas last year, the hope seemed to be hoping that he'd kind of break out. Do you think in this Texans offense, which is kind of an offshoot of a Shanahan offense, which we've seen feature tight ends, do you think that Schultz could get featured or do you feel like he's just going to revert back to, you know, middling tight end who could fringe be a top 12 tight end maybe? I think he's very likely to have top 10 targets at the position. I don't think Dalton Schultz, the playmaker, is all that intriguing. And I think that the Texans offenses will not get to the red zone very often. Mm-hmm. But to me, the number one stat that carries over year over year, and it sounds crazy, is just fantasy points per game last year. And he's being ranked well after mm-hmm. where he's finished. I know he changed the offense, but going from D- or uh, Dak Prescott down to C.J. Stroud certainly – Uh, a downgrade but also the texans wide receiver group is among the worst in the league so i think dalton schultz is going to play a lot i think he's gonna get a lot of a lot of check down targets i think that cj stroud could throw the ball around and i they have checked it checked it down to dalton schultz a couple times in this preseason already so i've been drafting him but the reason why i've been drafting him most importantly is because the tier of players that are around him just seems awful like all the wide receivers and running backs i'm like i don't want any of these other dudes and a lot of the times dalton schultz would be like my first tight end and then i'll draft like the luke musgrave and kind of like the upside guys knowing that i think i'm going to get a tight end eight to tight end 14 season out of schultz and then i'll find another guy that has at least a chance to kind of break out into that top five discussion yeah, I completely agree with you, particularly on Underdog, where it's the 18 rounds. Like, I've been doing a bunch of drafts over there, co-drafted with my friend Joe, and I just find like Dalton Schultz is the last tight end where I like, okay, if I'm going with a two tight end build, can I get away with Schultz being one of them? And it just, it's a very easy click because the wide receivers, you're talking like the Alan Lazard, Juju Smith-Schuster range, you're talking about running backs like Jamal Williams, who much as we loved him last year, it yeah. gets messy. There's an awful lot of other running backs who 
aren't particularly pretty. So, yeah, I'll keep drafting Dalton Schultz, but I'm yeah, if you were projecting how the target share is going to kind of be distributed amongst yeah. the Texans, do you think that Schultz can be top two within that, or do you feel like he can fall out of that? Because there's definitely not anyone with real experience outside of Nico Collins and Robert yeah. Woods. I think it'd be Nico Collins, Dalton Schultz, and Robert Woods having very similar target shares. And obviously Nico Nico Collins will have all the air yards of those three. Um, But yeah, I I can see Schultz being like 18% targets, which is like in line with like borderline tight end one usage. The touchdown uh, odds are very low though. So I think maybe more of a full PPR kind of late round tight end option, punt, punt off the position, make sure you win the flex with good wide receivers and running backs. I think that he could get you by, especially if your last round pick is somebody with a little bit more upside. So I think we should know who Dalton, Dalton Schultz was. And the NFL told us that because he signed yeah. for like $6 million this year, which is like fine, but nothing groundbreaking, like nowhere near like the franchise tag or anything like that. So I think he's a catch and fall reliable guy, probably really a perfect fit for this offense because he knows a lot of ball and they ask their tight ends to do a whole lot and also a perfect fit for CG Stroud. But the offense is just not going to be very good. So he's going to be fine. Yeah, <laughs> that covers it nicely. Tyler Higby next, who's tight end 13, going at 139 and underdog, 151 on sleeper. He's crept up from 160 when BBM opened up in May all the way up to 140. Last year wasn't pretty. I mean, you know, when Matthew Stafford was out, it was really ugly. But these are stats when Matthew Stafford was in the game. He had 6.1 targets per game, 38.2 yards, 7.1 points per game. That's uh, half PPR points. So there was something there. And I think when you look at Tyler Higby as a player, there's not really any competition. There's not really any competition in the tight end room with the Rams. And it just feels like, he could very easily be the two behind Cooper Cup. Do you feel like he's being undervalued and that the ADP is just slowly getting there? Or do you feel like maybe this Rams offense is just going to stink? I have him ranked as my tight end 11 and 116th overall player. So I'm a couple rounds earlier on him just for the reasons that you said. I think this defense could be historically trash. And Tyler Higby last year was staying in the block at way above career average rates because their left tackle was injured and the entire offensive line fell apart. I think they're going to get him out in the route a little bit more out of necessity because they don't have a true like number two or number three wide receiver right now. Like maybe Van Jefferson can become that, but like, it's not like it was like Robert Woods and Brandon cooks like it was previously, or like Todd Gurley. We're dealing with a bunch of question marks at the rest of the skill position, but more importantly, whenever Sean McVay is trailing in games, which I think the Rams will be doing, they play (laughs) so fast and they throw the ball so often I think we could look up and nobody will like it. And then Tyler Higby finishes like fifth or sixth among tight ends and targets this year. So he is somebody that I am like willing to like punt off the upside of the other guys, make sure I have a really good quarterback, running back wide receiver. And if I have to start Tyler Higby in week one, I think the volume in the fourth quarter is going to be there. It's going to be super ugly. Tyler Higby is not that good of a player, but we've at least seen some peaks of him. So if, you're drafting on underdog and you're looking at this from a best ball perspective. If you've got Travis Kelsey or Mark Andrews, would you be okay with Tyler Higby as your tight end two and no other tight ends after that? Or would you feel the need to add a third? Yeah, for sure. I think most of, most of the time when I go with Travis Kelsey, I'm probably going to wait until like more like the Jake Ferguson, Luke Musgrave tier, which is a couple rounds after this. But I draft a lot of my Dalton Schultz or Tyler Higby teams with two more tight end two with upside and just, Hopefully, I can predict that Dalton Schultz breakout season. Hopefully, break out like Higby did a couple years ago, or uh, Waller did a couple seasons before that. There's always a one or two guys that kind of come out of nowhere. Like last year, Njoku and Evan Ingram were like tight end 18s uh, on underdog, and like they were very good picks. So I think there's always a couple of these guys. You're not going to get top five finishes from these guys, but I do think we can refresh. And like if the whole position sucks and you got a tight end seven finish, I think that you'd be pretty happy with that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, at tight end, you just you're looking for help. You look for someone who stays on the field, and you're just looking for sort of consistency. I mean, last year, Evan Ingram was the only tight end drafted outside of the top hundred picks who had a hundred yard game. It's like these players just aren't giving you mm-hmm. huge spike weeks outside of touchdowns. And we are going to get onto another tight end in a second. But if you're here, you're still watching. I know you're enjoying it. We cover everything here. We've got redraft, best ball. We've got 
best ball streams. We've got best ball strategy. Rich is churning out dynasty content left, right, and center. In season, we'll have weekly matchup videos as well as all my DFS works here. Hit that subscribe button. Let us help you. And Sam Laporta, I know that you're excited to talk about this guy. He's going at 142 on underdog. You've kind of slowly pumped his ADP up through drafting season. On sleeper, lagging behind by sort of 17 picks at 159. Do you think the people on sleeper just need to get on board with this and uh, realize that the Lions are desperate for a tight end to be what TJ Hawkinson was and really, you know, Sam Laporta isn't just any kind of rookie. He is a wide receiver turn tight end. Yeah, so this one's very interest, interesting to me because I can see this going either direction. Laporta is a decent wide receiver, or receiving tight end prospect. His numbers are all good. He's athletic, all that. The problem with Laporta, to me, was he's small. And some of these small rookie tight ends are the ones that get the rug pulled. Now, his target competition is like completely <laughs> non-existent. Like We're dealing with basic nobodies out there. But his head coach also happens to be one of the most physical ex tight ends in the whole league, and Dan Campbell. So I think the expectations are going to be high of them. Everything seems pretty good on the training camp reports for Sam Laporta. I do think that he's going to get some targets out there. I'm very curious to see if he's going to be a true every down player just because he is definitely on the smaller side. Yeah, so earlier this soft season, I was doing some writing with you guys over on the dog, and I wrote an article about rookie tight ends. And- 87% of rookie tight ends drafted since the year 2000. They failed to average more than 5.9 half PPR points per game. Whereas, like last year, 22 different tight ends exceeded that. So, are you kind of banking on spike weeks for Sam Laporte making him worthwhile in best ball? Or do you feel like he's going to be consistent enough to have him redraft? Um, I don't think he's going to be that consistent. I, of all of the rookie tight ends, I don't, I haven't really been drafting Laporte. He's gotten steamed early because it was very clear especially one of their depth tight ends uh was ruled out for the season um i he was just kind of going well to ahead of the luke musgrave types and i thought the other tight ends actually were better than sam laporta when i was watching like i think that michael mayer's better luke musgrave's better and dalton kincaid's better but i'm kind of an, on an island here he was the first tight end to really get steamed up this off season. Um, and I understand why the playing time is going to be there, but he's just also always just going a couple spots too early for me. Yeah, I, I found Jared Goff a cool click this year as well. Like it just felt like a little too early, and I've probably balanced that out slightly as we've got going. But a tight end who I'm definitely in on, and I feel like is being undervalued. He's crept up from 170 all the way to kind of like 145, dropped just back down to 150 recently on underdog, going at 172 on sleeper, which I feel is massively undervalued. Like, the Chargers, they're set for a big bounce back year, you know, they got rid of uh, Joe Lombardi, replacing with Kellen Moore, Justin Herbert's healthy, he's going to be able to throw the ball at a better more downfield rate, you'd imagine, than the kind of 6.4 yards per attempt that he did last year. Do you think if the downfield game really gets going, is that bad news for Gerald Everett? Or do you think that he's still going to have enough layup shots where he can turn in these kind of yard after the catch plays that he's really good at? So with the Chargers, the pass attempts and the passing yards were there. It really was like the touchdowns that just didn't get there. And I'm afraid that like getting both Keenan and Mike Williams back on the field and adding Quentin Johnston uh, makes it a little bit more difficult for Gerald Everett, who's, who is on a little bit on the smaller side when it comes to tight end. So I have him right at ADP. He's also like somebody where I don't want to get too bullish on because like we've kind of seen Gerald Everett for years kind of in this role where he's like the opportunity is like kind of there for, for the taking, but he's like been okay with it. Um, they kind of like Donald Parham a little bit. Maybe he mixes in a little bit more, but if I've drafted Justin Herbert, obviously like Gerald Everett's like right in the tight end two mix for a lot of my teams. But I would be pretty surprised if like Gerald Everett was like the random type 10 touchdown season that we usually get once every couple years. Um, just because I think those balls might be going to big Mike Williams. Well, Speaking of like tight ends, you can go for 10 touchdowns. Your co-host Josh this week on your hot takes episode, which everyone should check, it's in the description below, 
said that Juwan Johnson could be the man who could lead the position in touchdowns. Uh, you know, he's going at pick 164, which it's been a bit of a slide. I think part of that can be attributed to Alvin Kamara's suspension not being as long as people thought. Michael Thomas being actually seems to be healthy, seems to be okay. He is creeping back up now. Uh, the hype seems to be building for him. But on sleeper, he's going outside the top 200, which again, feels undervalued for me. Mm. Last year, it was only Travis Kelsey and George Kittle who scored more touchdowns than Juwan Johnson. He was a tight end 13 in points per game. Do you feel like everybody should be on board with Josh's prediction? And, you know, can Juwan Johnson just take another step and really break out this year? I think Juwan Johnson has really good film. So I think we should start there. And it's not a surprise that his role has gotten bigger because every single NFL season because he used to play wide receiver. He's like some huge, massive wide receiver and now turned tight end. And it took a little bit of time for him to like learn the position in the NFL, but they paid him some money and he was very good last year. And his tape was very good this preseason early on. I think his ADP fell because like Foster Moreau was back on the team. They signed Jimmy Graham. Everyone's obsessed with Taysom Hill and like the theory of Taysom Hill. One problem with Taysom Hill, he was playing behind Jimmy Graham in the preseason and his coach is no longer there and there's running backs and there's two good quarterbacks now so i don't think Taysom's gonna get there Jawan johnson just everybody needs to go watch him like pay attention to Jawan johnson's tape he i think he's a really good underrated player now scoring 10 touchdowns this year and leading the position is uh definitely a bold take <laughs> but i have been drafting Jawan johnson and i i think his adp is probably two or three rounds too late yeah, I mean, you know, he led the Saints in red zone targets last year. And yes, we're moving on from Andy Dalton to Derek Carr. But I just think people were worried about Taysom Hill too much. But Taysom Hill's a rep, you know, he's a running back more than he's a tight end. Mm -hmm. And it's like, particularly now and again, like you'll get people asking about, oh, should I be taking Taysom Hill in tight end premium? It's like, no, because he's not going to catch you the ball. He's going to catch He can't you. run routes like straight up. <laughs> like he just can't run routes. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll move on to another player. Irv Smith, he's going at 172 on underdog, 213 on sleeper. And his ADP's jumped from sort of like 180, I mean, really bottomed out of the beginning of drafts and crept up. He is the tight end 21 in ADP. And the numbers of, number of believers in Irv Smith, it seems to have dwindled a bit over the year, but those who still do believe him are just as passionate and committed as ever despite him not really ever having done huge amounts in the NFL. He's never been able to earn targets in an offense. He's ranked 58th in targets per route run in 2019 and 59th last year in 2020. Do you feel like his ADP is just being propped up by the fact that he's attached to Joe Burrow? Like, Do you feel like there's any chance we could see an Irv Smith breakout this year? 1% chance. It's <laughs> I just like don't see this. There, I think he's only the only reason why he has an ADP is – because people like to stack on underdog, which like granted there is some correlation that I chase as well, but like your graphic shows, like he's never been good. The NFL he was a free agent this year. The NFL didn't think he was good. I think that he's like on a maybe $2 million contract this year. I There's a chance he gets benched. Like I, I don't, I just don't see it with him. He's also undersized, might not be a full-time player was never that good at Alabama. He's always like this, like, in progress in development type of player and the vikings gave up on him and also on top of that he has a massive injury history so all the other guys we've mentioned on this podcast i have multiple tiers above irv yeah it, it just feels like people latch on to the spike week a little bit for uh, hayden hurst and uh, cj azoma over the last couple of years but like hayden hurst last year he averaged 7.1 ppr points in games when he didn't score a touchdown he only scored two touchdowns all season two-thirds of his games resulted in single-digit fantasy returns. The Bengals, they just they don't need to feature tight ends. You know, they pass to the position of a ninth-lowest rate of any offense in the league because we've got elite wide receivers and we've got above-average running back mm -hmm. play. So, yeah, I just... I can't get there. I feel like I've had too many conversations on Twitter where people talk about the Week 17 matchup with the Chiefs. And oh, God. That's, that's, that's not enough for me to be taking any shots. Uh, well, we do have a, go on. But, but by the way, with the, the other tight ends that you're talking about, Uzoma and Hayden Hurst, they're on like $20 million deals. Like the NFL thinks those guys can play. The NFL does not think Irv Smith can play. So even if 
Uzoma and Hayden Hurst got there on occasion. And I, I believe like some of the Uzoma spikes were like 60 yard touchdowns where he's like left <laughs> wide open on like leak plays. Like that's not, that wasn't even sustainable in the first place. But the difference in tier between those type of players and Irv Smith on top of just the size concerns, it's yeah, it's way too much. Yeah, I mean, and we saw the moment TJ Hawkinson landed in Minnesota, he was able to earn targets and be productive in a way that Irv Smith never was. Like, yep. you know, egregious drops, injury issues. It just, yeah, the NFL told us what we think. Uh, mm-hmm. We do have a couple more times to go, but if you haven't already hit that like button, leave us comments. I want to know what you think about Irv Smith, whether you've been drafting him. And if you've got a better argument than the ones I've heard on Twitter, I'd love to hear it. Um, <laughs> I would love to hear those too. <laughs> <laughs> you've mentioned his name so many times tonight already. We've got to get to Luke Musgrave. Going as tight end 22 on underdog, 172, 196 on sleeper. And it feels like... Luke Musgrave, you know, when he was selected halfway through the second round, the, it was briefly wheels up. And then we took took a craft slightly later, and there was a bit of trepidation about, okay, well, is it going to be one of them? Is it going to be both of them? But ever since training camp opened up, I mean, I'll go back to the previous chart. You can just see from sort of August onwards, it's just been a rocket ship for Luke Musgrave. It, how high have you got him ranked in your rankings Ooh. in? I have Luke Musgrave as my tight end 14th, 120th overall. He's also my highest drafted player through 100 drafts. I have him on like 33% of my underdog teams. Do you have any kind of concerns about Jordan Love and this offense? Because, I mean, Jordan Love as a quarterback, he's got less career dropbacks than Trey Lance. And we've just seen yeah. what's happened to Trey Lance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have tons of concerns with Jordan Love, but the even the worst offenses complete passes and score touchdowns and Jordan love, although this is like his rookie season, he has been in this system for a long time. Uh, I've also noticed the other guys like Jaden Reed and Romeo Dobbs might be a little bit better than given credit for. So maybe there's a chance that this offense can move the chains in ways that like the worst case scenarios uh, wouldn't be happening. But for Luke Musgrave, really he's a full-time player. Like he's been a full-time player since since preseason week one if you're reading the reports before that he was on the field every single snap what's crazy about him is he had almost zero production at oregon state yet still went in the second round and that was only because of injuries well he's healthy right now if he would have played at oregon state that entire last season i think he would have been a first round pick and he would be considered right next to dalton kincaid as a prospect but he's just a full-time player and he's been blocking extremely well in these preseason games. And that was kind of his like big holdup is like, is he just some finesse tall seam stretching guy, but he's been blocking on the Jaden Reed touchdown the preseason. That was him uh, against a D end in isolation in pass pro one of the run running touchdowns. It was behind him uh, in the red zone. So I think he's got a full-time role and beyond that, like they're having like run go balls against man covers or on the perimeter. They're doing leaks. They're doing jet sweeps and practices. I'm seeing run option routes and his three cone and stuff was exceptional for somebody as big as he is. So like he just looks like one of like, sometimes you just like see like a, a all pro tight end move and you're like, Oh, like that guy's like freaky. I think Luke Musgrave, when you watch him, like has that like freaky kind of run away from you ability. So, in terms of redraft, we'll just switch back over to that kind of mindset for a minute. Going mm-hmm. at almost pick 200 on sleeper, would you feel comfortable completely punting the tight end position and taking a shot on him from day one into your managed lineups, or would you be wanting to pair him with another, you know, like Dalton Schultz one earlier and then see how it plays yeah. out? Yeah, I think I would go like Ninjoku and then Musgrave is my last pick. Like in a redraft, no one's heard of this dude. Like that's just like the reality. Like only the best ball sickos know Luke Musgrave. So like literally your last pick, throw him on your bench. But I do think enough of these guys that we're talking about have enough appeal that I would rather wait, get somebody like Schultz or David Njoku, Pat Fryermuth, who like they're going to be on the tight end one, two borderline. And then beyond them, my last pick can be Luke Musgrave. And if like I hit the jackpot, I can trade the other one. I could keep both play matchups, uh, figure it out later. But um, I do think that he's worthy of a last round pick and redraft. Nice. Well, let's move on to our final tight end here. Dawson Knox, who's going as tight end 24, 186 on underdog, 205 on sleeper. And really, yeah, the ADP just bottomed out pretty much as soon as drafts opened up because of the Dolan Kincaid effect. Uh, last year, he regressed from the previous year where he scored nine touchdowns, just down to only five last year. 
And in the nine games that he played and didn't find the end zone, he averaged 6.2 PPR points at 3.3 receptions, which ranked 17th among tight ends. All the talk is about Dolan Kincaid and how he's going to play more like a true wide receiver than a tight end. He's going to play out of the slot. But if that happens, does it mean that Dalton, uh, Dawson Knox is going to be playing from the traditional tight end position and still able to be on the field a lot and actually potentially a value? I think it's going to be very hard for him to squeeze out like a top 12 fantasy season, but I do think he's like quite likely to be like in the top 24 conversation if you're in like some crazy deep league or uh, just kind of a streaming option for you. Um, Yeah, he's going to be out there a lot. Like he's an interesting player because he's not that good of a blocker. He's like a decent sized guy. And that's like the kind of scary part with the bills is like both Knox and Kincaid for this like 12 personnel it's probably like the like worst run blocking duo among 12 personnel in like the league or that I can possibly remember. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how they kind of work that out. But if Kincaid is truly like a Cole Beasley from this offense, I think there's a chance that Dawson Knox could like see like, like what this graphic says, like the 17th most targets in yards. Uh, He just has to get really lucky with touchdowns. And I think that's, we've probably seen the best of Dawson Knox. Yeah, I think that's fair. So before we get out of here, I mean, you guys over at Underdog, you're incredibly busy. I know you've got, you know, new contests going left, right, and center. Is there anything in particular that you're excited about over the minute? Yeah, I mean, the last two uh, contests we dropped are like, to me, they're the curveballs to what best ball is. Like, best ball has completely exploded, just 18 rounds, optimal lineups, all that. But what we're trying to do now is like innovate beyond that within the best ball format. We don't want to waste your time picking up players, setting your lineups, trading, uh, getting trade requests, doing any of that stuff. We want you just to draft and get out of there. But we introduced weekly winners, which is 17 contests in one season. Your team is the same throughout the season, but it's a new tournament every single week. There's a lot of strategy components with that one. And then what we just launched was the eliminator. And that's a $6 contest. And it's like, if you're used to survivor contest, it's you just got to finish in like the top half of your pod every single week. And then teams just get eliminated week by week by week until we get to week 17. So lots of fun ways. We're trying to make it where you play on underdog, you do a bunch of drafts in the off season. And then all of a sudden during the season, you have a bunch of teams. Like I've already drafted a hundred of them. I know there's users on our account that have drafted thousands of teams for this upcoming season, but once Tuesday rolls around, you're not doing waiver wire Sunday morning. You're not setting your lineups. You can go out, hang out with the family. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun over at underdog. So just one last question on weekly winners, which, mm-hmm. you know, that one, it's kind of two thirds full of a minute. And obviously I'd expect that really picks up as BBM fills, but do you think there's an edge to be gained by treating that as like a week one DFS contest? Because that is going to be the week where you have most information about the players ready to draft. Do you think if anybody sort of sat holding back some entries, mm-hmm. that's the time where people should be, you know, concentrate now on BBM, concentrate on the Eliminator, and in that last week really hammer it and try to go with that early season information? I think there's that's certainly an angle. That's what's fun about this is you can draft a bunch of rookies and suspend the players and injured players, and then you set yourself up for late season success. Or you can do what Tom's saying right now and draft a bunch of players that project really well. Where we have all the information. The tournament tournament payouts are the same the entire season, so you're just kind of building a team that kind of fits together. You want them to like peak at the right time of the calendar. But for me, with with weekly winners, I would study the format now just a little bit because I think what's going to happen is. Best Ball Mania and the Eliminator are going to fill probably a couple days to a week earlier than the NFL season. And then weekly winners will be the biggest tournament available on Underdog Fantasy. So what I think is going to happen is a lot of people after they've maxed out these other tournaments are just going to be like, all right, I'm going to start playing weekly winners without doing a whole lot of research. So I have a couple columns. I've done a couple streams on it. But I think there's going to be a lot of people that are playing this format for the first time that haven't studied the game. So I do think there could be a, a lot of edge out there for people that want to give this thing a crack and worst case you'll draft the team and you'll have 17 weeks of sweat but i do think there's an actual edge out there for people that want to study it just because at the last second a lot of people are going to be throwing things at this that haven't really paid attention to all the strategy love it i mean definitely i mean there's no drafting experience like drafting on on the dog and that is going to do it is we've already covered wide receivers on the channel you can check that out we've got hayden's co-host josh norris that's linked below 
Dwayne McFarland, who's on talking nice. about the running backs. That video will be out very soon, as well as quarterbacks with a yet unnamed guest. And if you haven't already, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. We're going to keep rolling loads of content to get you ready to win those championships. Mm -hmm.